Hi everyone, my name is Jordan, I'm the president of Alpha Chi Omega Sorority, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Michael Behe, Professor of Biochemistry. Thanks very much, Jordan. And as, as she said, I'm a professor of biochemistry, and, and uh, for a while I was a normal scientist. Uh, I started out doing normal scientific things. I was a postdoc at the NIH uh, working on uh, DNA structure. I did a dissertation on sickle cell disease. And for the first uh, decade or so of my time at Lehigh, I was publishing papers and getting grants like uh, everybody's supposed to. But somewhere along the way, I, I got a, a hitch. I hit a bump. And uh, within the past 10 years, uh, the president of the National Academy of Sciences uh, denounced me personally in a letter sent out to all 2,000 members of the National Academy of Sciences. And that's not something you want to happen if you uh, are career-minded. Uh, <laughs> most scientific societies have condemned my work. And if you look on Lehigh's biology department website, you'll see that they dissociate themselves from me. <laughs> So why is that the case? It's, it's the case because I changed my mind about a particular uh, scientific theory, Darwin's theory uh, of how life developed on Earth. Uh, and that, uh, that set, set off all sorts of alarms. Uh, so how did I, I do that? Well, uh, here's my story. I'm a Roman Catholic. I've always believed in God. But I was taught Darwin's theory of evolution in parochial school. Uh, we were taught that by the good sisters there that God made the laws of the universe and, and everything. And if he wanted to make life by secondary causes, you know, who are we to disagree? And that sounded good to me. You know, who was I to tell God what to do? Uh, and so I was very comfortable, very happy with that. Uh, and uh, remained so uh, up until I was an associate professor here at Lehigh in the mid 1980s. And uh, uh, then I hit that bump. I read a book. That, always a bad thing to do. Uh, <laughs> I read a book called Evolution: A Theory in Crisis by a man named Michael Denton, who was a geneticist from Australia and an agnostic at the time. And his book pointed out a number of difficulties with Darwin's theory that I, a tenured professor at the time, had never heard of. Uh, and it shocked me. And, Dar and Denton, uh, Denton didn't have any idea of his own to propose in place. He was just sick of Darwinists claiming for their theory uh, so much when he saw so many problems with it. I had never heard of a scientist criticizing Darwin's theory before, and I was astounded. And in biochemistry, you study all sorts of extremely complicated systems. And while I was studying as a grad student, postdoc, and so on, I'd always, you know, occasionally scratch my head and say, "Gee, how did that evolve?" And then I shrug my shoulders and say, "Well, I got it. I guess somebody else knows." And I'd go on and do my work. But because of reading Dutton's book, I said, who has shown, who does know how that evolved? And the nice thing about science is you can go to the science library and look up the papers that have been published and ask yourself, who has published papers on how these extraordinarily complex systems that reside in, in your body and the bodies of all organisms on Earth uh, might have come about? And I was astounded to find that nobody had. Nobody had published any real studies on that. There were occasional hand-waving, uh, vague stories, but nothing that would count as a real scientific explanation. And so at that point, I got ticked off, because uh, a large part of the way that I thought the world worked, uh, I found out was based not on compelling evidence, but on sociology. You know, this is what we were supposed to, this is the way modern scientists think about these things. And though I wasn't interested in evolution before then, I certainly got interested in it uh, afterward. Uh, but for the first, next couple of years, I really didn't do anything about it because I didn't know what to do. Uh, but then, by chance, I fell in with some bad company. Uh, I, I uh, 
uh, was contacted by a, a group of other academics who were also skeptical of, of Darwin's theory. And uh, by interacting with, with them, uh, they allowed me to see that I had a way of looking at the problem that nobody else had, even, even them. And also by interacting with them, they uh, allowed me to broaden my vision of what I could do. Because you see, scientists don't write books. They barely read books. They write papers. They write short five to 20 page papers. And those are predominantly what they read too. But this group had philosophers in it, historians, um, uh, uh, theologians, lawyers, and besides other scientists. And they not only read books, they, they wrote them. And so I got the idea of writing a book uh, uh, from them and eventually did write a book called Darwin's Black Box about my, uh, my uh, objections to Darwin's theory. Uh, and these are them in a, in a nutshell. Uh, Darwin thought the cell was a little glob of jelly. All scientists of his age did. Pro, uh, a little glob of simple protoplasm. Nothing, nothing, uh, not a big deal at all. But in the last 50 to 100 years, science has shown that that is utterly uh, upside down. <coughs> the cell is perhaps the most sophisticated uh, piece of machinery that exists anywhere in the universe. Um, and when I say machinery, I mean that literally. The cell is chock full of molecular machines, little trucks and buses that go from one place to another in the cell, little signposts that tell the trucks and buses where to turn and, and, and so on. Why is this a problem for Darwin's theory? Well, it turns out that Darwin knew that his theory had to be a gradual one. That is, that uh, Darwinian evolution had to work by numerous successive slight modifications of existing materials in the cell, one of which might give a slight advantage to uh, its bearer and proceed slowly to improve the organism over time. Can I have the first slide, please? Uh, but there's a lot of mach machinery that, is, that poorly fits with that mode of explanation. And here's a little machine from our everyday world which shows the problem. And it's a problem I call irreducible complexity. Now, a mousetrap is a machine that catches mice, of course, <coughs> and it, but it needs a number of parts to work. How could you gradually make something like a mousetrap uh, by something like a Darwinian process? How could you start out with something simple and, um, and end up with this by numerous successive slight modifications? You know, would you start with, say, just the wooden platform there and hope to catch mice inefficiently, maybe by tripping them? Uh, and then maybe you could add the holding bar. And when the mouse tripped over, it might impale itself on the holding bar, and that would be an improvement. Uh, odds are against that. That probably wouldn't work. So it turns out that this is a simple machine. And the more complex machines get, the more and more difficult they get, uh, they are to explain by gradual means. And the machinery in your body is a whole lot more, uh, whole lot more uh, sophisticated than this. But not only is the mouse trap irreducibly complex, anybody in this room would look at it and immediately know that this is not just a pile of pieces. This is a machine. This was arranged this way. This was designed. How do you recognize design? And remember, design is the D in head. Uh, how do you recognize design? If you look in a dictionary, design is often defined as the purposeful arrangement of parts. And whenever we see parts arranged to fulfill a purpose, we recognize design. Uh, uh, next slide, please. This is just a little aid to help you. Here's a pile of Legos, and there's a pile of Legos. Now, what's the difference between those two piles of Legos? Well, anybody can see that the right-hand pile of Legos is purposely arranged. We recognize design by its physical properties, by its physical manifestations. We do not need some sort of uh, inspiration or, or revelation to tell us that something was designed. Uh, <coughs> uh, next slide, please. 
Here's a cover from a, an issue of the journal Cell from about a decade ago, a special review issue on macromolecular machines. You're, as I said before, your cells are chock full of machines. And so since we can tell that even a purposeful arrangement of parts as simple as a mousetrap is intelligent looking design, I argue that we can tell that uh, these sophisticated machines are designed too. And what sort of an argument is that? Uh, the argument is, is like this. Next, last slide, please. Uh, what is that? <laughs> well, if it looks like a duck, and it walks like a duck, and it talks like a duck, then we are justified in thinking, unless somebody comes along with very great evidence otherwise, that that is a duck. And that's kind of a colloquial way of saying, uh, of making an argument that philosophers call a kind of deductive argument. Uh, and uh, so the uh, argument for design is, I think, an inductive argument, which actually makes it uh, scientific. And I've just run out of time, so thank you very much.